Hi, welcome everybody. We, we certainly have a great group of people here, a lot of esteemed uh, bodies of knowledge, experience, uh, a lot of insight into a very, very complex mechanism that we like to call branding. And I was thinking about this as I've listened to a lot of the different discussions today going on. And there's this, uh, there's this quote that I love. And, and I've used this before, by the way. But uh, this was done, uh, this was said by a man named John Stewart um, about a particular company. And he said, um, if this business were to be split up, I would be glad to take the brands, trademarks, and goodwill. And you can have all the bricks and mortar, and I would fare better than you. And this is very important to me because I believe that brands, and I think we heard a bit of this before uh, when Mitch was up here speaking, uh, brands are a piece of business that transcends all of these other parts of what we do. They live on, they breathe on, but they aren't without an intense amount of work, strategy, and thought on how these brands come to be. And I had an opportunity to speak with uh, the panel um, prior to getting up here, and we tried to zero in on a couple topics that I think might be very helpful for everybody uh, in the room. And one of the things that I have seen firsthand with many of the clients that we work with is they come to us, they need help, they need visual identities, they, uh, they need strategies, they need to understand media, um, all very complex landscapes, uh, but they also tend to really struggle the moment they want to be on the shelf. And I know that there's been a lot of discussion today about um, dispensaries, um, and I like to call them in dispensaries because they are an absolute piece of exactly the business that we work with today. Um, but I want to give a chance for um, our panel to try to talk about some of the ways that they have been able to take uh, the brands that they represent, the brands that they've built, uh, the brands that they are administering today, and taking that step to have those present on shelves, differentiated uh, and recognizable um, outside of their brand ambassador, their salesperson, being there to explain all of the product benefits and the attributes, et cetera. So I kind of just want to open it up and get some um, initial thoughts on how you were able to take your brand and get it out there and the struggles, the challenges, et cetera, that you overcame. And if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. If that's all right. I admire your brand. Hello. So place to start. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I, it's such a big question. Um, how, so... So why don't you uh, try to provide for the room an understanding of how the brand look and feel. Let's just start with one component of it, your visual identity. Um, how you chose what your brand looks like today um, and some of the strategy and thought that was put in that. Uh, a lot of thought went into it. Um, we spent a year and a half just talking about our brand before we even launched anything. So we founded uh, Key Coco in, well, actually four years ago, a little over four years ago. We had been looking at cannabis for about five years in total. And what we, um, when we were out there investigating the uh, landscape, what we realized is that there was a tremendous amount of white space at the dispensaries for products that were focused on women. And and there were uh, there was a gap. There were at the time there were no low dose products uh, geared towards women. Everything was pretty. Um, Pretty bro, pretty Snoop Dogg, you know, thousand south thousand milligram um, bars and things. We said our demographic, uh, we are in our 50s. Our demographic is uh, not going to go into a dispensary and, and be attracted by those products. So if we're going to create products by women for women, then we need them to be, you know, really approachable. So we, we literally, I mean, we had so many. To your point, I mean, it's a great point. We spent a lot of time strategizing and. And thinking about it, but I think it was less strategy and more heart, because we said if we're going to put products out there into the world, what do we want them to represent? What do we want them to look like? And we knew based on hundreds and hundreds of conversations with women that they were looking for alternatives to pharmaceuticals and alcohol, and they wanted Lodo's products. And we knew we we felt we just had a hunch if we made these beautiful, if we made them low dose, if they spoke to women, we felt like we could really um, 
uh, get their attention and, and really be part of a, a movement. Um, you know, women are the fastest growing category, as you all probably know, in cannabis now. And I think it's uh, that brand that stands for something that's authentic. Um, and we would never release a product to, um, to, to f anybody, to folks, if we weren't willing to ingest it ourselves. So I think the product quality, I mean, if you go on our website, you'll see that we have six unbreakable rules. Uh, rule number one is no assholes. Um, we have uh, unrelenting quality. And I think it's, you know, we, we live by these rules, both internally and with our, with our products. And it's just something that it's, it's, it's part of us. And I'd like to think that our, um, our personalities and the personalities of our team are really coming through in our, in our brand. And I think that's why it's resonating. Um, it seems to be resonating with, with people so much. I, I think it's working. I think it's. I think. I think it shows uh, in all that you do right now. So, um, can we just move on down the line a little bit here? Would that be all right? Yeah, for sure. For Jetty Extracts, it's a, a, a bit of a different journey. You know, we we were one of the first entrants into vape back in 2013, and um, we're working on the product. Uh, one of the founders recognized some opportunity to to begin to build a brand and to actually have really nicely branded packages, and and so. We were, you know, among the early entrants with, with we feel, a pretty full-fledged branded design. Um, I joined about a year and a half ago, and we realized that though we had some marketing, it was not fully developed, and we had a lot of work to do. Um, obviously, with the changes coming into the marketplace, we had to make sure that our packaging and our identity uh, was going to work for the new market. And so I, I wish I could say we spent an hour and a, a year and a half working and researching, but it was much more compressed than that, unfortunately. And so we, we tackled brand identity and packaging pretty much at the same time. And um, you know, I, I do like where we landed. We have a unique form factor with the tubes for our packaging and a, a cleaner, more sophisticated design, but we're actually not done. We have quite a bit more brand strategy work to do to, to fully realize what the brand is and what it's becoming and roll it out to the rest of our channels. So uh, we had to, by necessity, really focus on the, the packaging and what, what the product's going to look like out in the store. And so that's been our primary focus. And unfortunately, we, you know, we now we have to kind of bring the rest of the brand along with it. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a dirty secret. Hopefully the, the market doesn't see that. I'll share it with all of our friends here today. But, um, you know, we expect to keep evolving it over the next, you know, the coming months. So, uh, Harris, before you answer, so real quick with um, Jetty, just because it's such a uh, well-known brand at this point, it's it's been seen. It's got, it's got shelf space and it's been out there. Um, for the benefit of the room, describe a bit of the, what I like to call the ethos of your brand. Because sure. I'm sure that's something you're familiar with. Yes, it's, it's, it's a fair question. So, so for us, you know, we, we believe that Cannabis and vape in particular is just part of a healthy, creative, active lifestyle. We're not doctors, um, but we're very much committed to making products we love. And so that's really the, the heart of what we do. It's, it's Nate Ferguson, he's a co-founder and our master extractor, and, and he's, he's the face of it. He's the guy in the factory working on formulations, stressing about it, putting love and care and, and craft into everything that we do. And everything really just emanates from that. It's, it's, it's making products that we ourselves like to consume. And, you know, I happen to be a bunch of surfers and, and kind of active lifestyle people. And, and that's just really organically become part of the brand. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think for me coming in when I did, I, I saw all of this authenticity as this company that just loves what we do and believes in what we do. And so just building that in terms of the brand now is, is really my challenge, but it was there to begin with. It may not have been expressed the way everybody wanted to, or at least wasn't quite as developed, but, but that's my charge now. I have a lot of great story to work with. Yeah, that's great. And it, it, it's, it's apparent in the packaging, it's apparent in the, the touch and the feel, the functionality of all the products. I mean, it, it really comes through. So I believe what you just said, okay? Go ahead, Harris. <clears throat> Yeah, so let me just give a little bit of context of who I am, uh, since I'm a little bit new to, Great the, idea. Uh, new to the industry. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Harris Rabin, and I've spent the last 15 years as a marketing uh, branding executive at large CPG companies. So I spent about 10 years uh, at Bayer Consumer Care, Bayer Healthcare, uh, and I built and grew amazing brands like Bayer Aspirin and Aleve and one day vitamins. Uh, I then spent uh, the last five years at AB InBev, uh, working on innovation, launching new innovation, and also over the last couple of years, uh, managing a sev several billion dollar uh, portfolio as the uh, global vice president uh, of, of marketing. So 
for me, uh, it's been a journey, and I'm happy to say, actually, that I've committed myself to the cannabis industry. As of last Thursday, I've left AB InBev. Woo! Uh, and it actually, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to have worked for those uh, two industries, consumer healthcare uh, and beverage alcohol, because I actually think cannabis is the perfect intersection of those uh, two industries, and I believe fundamentally that this is a wellness uh, industry uh, and that it is all about brands. This will be a CPG industry. So uh, I'm committing myself to that. I've partnered with amazing private equity company, Purple Rock Capital Partners, uh, a, a new uh, a fund within that, Purple Rock Cannabis Partners, uh, and we are very excited about uh, investing in consumer facing brands uh, and also as a consultant helping those industries like Bev Alcohol. Uh, and uh, other CPG companies, uh, healthcare, move into the industry. So, what I find fascinating about what you guys, uh, how you guys answer the question, is I think you're right on. You notice how both of you spent a lot of time and are still spending time defining the strategy, defining you know before you ever get to the shelf, uh, what is the positioning of the brand? What do you stand for? What are your values? What are those shared values with consumers? Uh, how do you think about the, the benefits that you're giving to, to your consumers? Why aren't you just plastering every form factor uh, for every occasion? Because that's not what you stand for. You stand for one thing and you know, you know what you stand for. And that's really important. And I think once you have articulated that strategy and really have nailed it, then it pervades. It pervades through your visual brand identity. Um, it pervades through all your communications. Uh, there's a big difference between brands who know who they are, who know who they're targeting, and how they show up in every aspect. You know, marketing and branding is not about a packaging. It's about all aspects of the way you show up uh, to the consumer. And you, you guys are both, uh, from what I've seen, uh, very uh, as well, very diligent uh, about about that. Well, how do you follow that up, right? Um, so I, I think because we began in the from a dispensary perspective, before we chose our direction in brand development in 2016, uh, that experience drove us to really look at the consumer um, and then look at the cannabis market, who's in the cannabis market, who do we want in the cannabis market. And you start looking at a state like Colorado, 2.1% are consuming medically, getting somewhere between 10 or 11% today are now consuming on a recreational basis. What's going to bring the, the other, uh, you know, 90% into the market, and then ultimately, you know, what they're looking for, and I think I mentioned it earlier uh, today, is, you know, what is the why, right? So our, our exploration into brands began with one word, why. Why would you want my brand? Why would you choose it? Does it fit for you? Is it lifestyle integrated? Which took us into different directions about good for you. Well, what's good for you? Well, let's take a look at the, the, uh, the purchasing habits of Americans today. 40% of consumers consider what? the eco-impact of their purchase at the time of purchase. So now we're thinking eco-conscious. Eco well, cannabis, historically, earth-based, very organic, they care about the earth. And so our first product to market was with uh, um, BrewBuds. And BrewBuds is a 100% compostable product. The pod's compostable, the outer packaging's compostable. This is a good for the earth product. Um, and then it's also good for you because it's low calorie, it's coffees and teas, um, and it integrated in the lifestyle, right? So we tell a story when it was a medical market, we developed a product. So I would say, well, if my grandmother was sick and it was Christmas and she chose cannabis, would she have to go run off somewhere in a house and choose some more obtuse or, you know, outward uh, form of consumption? Or could she just throw a Keurig pot in a, in a coffee, brew it up, go to the table and enjoy the holiday with her family without any stigma, right? So we really looked at the consumer and said, what is your challenge? What do you want? How can I solve that? And that led the good for you, good for the earth movement with BrewBuds. Then that gave us our exposure into CPG because we didn't come from CPG. And they started learning, well, calories, healthy. you know. But now I need sessionability. I need low dose. I can't consume 100 milligrams, right? I need onset. I need to be able to manage this. If I want the program, I want the, the products, I want the community to, to roll out, it has to be consistent. And the consumer has to be able to self-regulate uh, their consumption. And so allowing those things to drive it forward. And then once we formed that position and we said, how do we create a win-win? How do we create a win for growers, for the retailers, the consumer, and ultimately the brand? 
and we, we, we created a program. We called it the Gram Plan. We approached uh, re, uh, the, the uh, growers and said, hey, guys, look, we're going to buy some of your flour to put it in our product, but we'd like you to donate 2,000 free pre-rolls. Right? The first response was what? Laughter. They laughed at us, right? But then we explained that we've already, through our messaging, pre-sold 60% of the state of Nevada. We've got orders waiting, and we're going to buy your flour. We're going to put a label of your brand, your flour, on the box, which gives you on-shelf marketing. You know what they said after that? Here's 2,000 free pre-rolls. They went to the retailers and said, guys, we're going to bring your program. You get a free pre-roll in every box of Brewbuds, which gave them the giveaway for the consumer. So the consumer won. So now I had a $45 value that they're buying for $25, whatever it was at the time. And now everybody in the sequence won. We created the right social media, began a campaign, and the consumer won, the retailer won, and the grower won. And they're all really happy to do business with us. So whether it's why the consumer or why your partners, it's got to be the whole thing. That's remarkable. And what, and what you just described is what I would say uh, an ideal scenario for any brand initiative to kind of take flight, right? But I also know from experience, and a lot of brands that I talk to, they don't have it as seamless. And so I think it would be interesting if uh, you get the opinions um, on the ideas of like walking into dispensaries, all the choices that are there. It's not like walking into a CVS or a Whole Foods at this point, right? There is a limited number of choices. Dispensaries are never gigantic. They are not warehouses at this point, right? Um, I would like to hear, and I think everybody in here could probably benefit from understanding a little bit of the travails and ways that you've overcome some of the uh, just challenges that exist with the way that a consumer can actually get your product today. And specifically, there are dispensaries, there are platforms like Ease, and what else? <laughs> because those are kind of it. So um, maybe if we could just go down the line again. I, I don't know. I liked how that worked. You all have such unique opinions on this. So. <clears throat> Would you? Okay. Is that okay? I, your, your product is so unique out of, out of these, and so I just think you have a unique perspective. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't easy, and I think as we all know that, um, you know, that the, the retail side of the industry is, is playing catch-up. Um, I think they're doing as good a job as they can, but I think there's so many complications this last year in 2018 with the regulations that it really was a, a you know, a moving goalpost. So it just made it very difficult for everybody. And I think now that we finally have landed on the regulations in California, that'll be a bit more streamlined. But we were just, I mean, we were really chasing our tail a lot of the time just because we couldn't make a lot of the um, commitments that we wanted to, to make. An example of that, for example, was um, buying uh, larger quantities of packaging and, and getting a CRP cans for our, for our tens, but, you know, not knowing how the regulations were going to come out. So it definitely had a, a trickle-down effect for us. So. For example, in our, if you've seen our cans, uh, we've got a can that we fit 10 tea bags into. And the cans at the time, they'll be uh, CRP uh, this spring. But uh, we had to put them into uh, uh, child-resistant bags that are not, uh, that are not see-through. And oftentimes for us, you know, so that's how they get delivered in the box, you know, to the dispensary. And sometimes, for example, the dispensaries weren't taking them out of the bags and merchandising them. Yeah, th th those are real world issues, and, and I totally... So that's like a challenge. And we know that, you know, because we've put so much time and energy into our packaging, our look and our feel and our brand, I mean, you know, it, it ain't going to sell that well if it's stuffed in a, in a white bag where the customer can't see it. So, you know, we're seeing a, a big difference already because going into 2019, we're, uh, we can take them out of the bags and then they, and they can merchandise them. But that's just a, a problem that we ran into. Um, and now we're just, we're seeing the impact of, of uh, you know, in a good way of, of sales as a result. But that's just kind of like one small thing that we had, we had to deal with. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, in that equation right there, uh, having a distribution partner, and we've all, you know, encountered this issue in the, in the industry, um, how does that work for you? And uh, you know how do you, how do you get your product everywhere that it needs to be? But I'm, I'm like specifically like what does that look like? I'm curious. Yeah, for us, we we're big believers in launch and learn, and we self-distributed our product when we launched in 2017, 
and we were in th we did a pilot we're big believers in pilot markets and we launched in 30 dispensaries and learned a ton and then we knew that um, once we saw that market acceptance and adoptability with our product and it, people loved it that's when we knew we could roll out um, and um, you know we worked through a lot of the, the scaling um, challenges and uh, then we signed up with a distributor so we joined forces with a uh, Kiva sales and distribution which was a great move for us, and they got us from you know 30 dispensaries to about 300 dispensaries. But I, I, I think the thing that also drove that was, if anybody heard our talk earlier today, we've gotten tons of press. I mean, we've gotten, I think Chelsea figured out we had 1.4 billion uh, media impressions. Uh, we have a phenomenal PR woman, and, and uh, we were in the seven-page spread in Oprah Magazine. We've been on NPR. We've been on GQ. We've, you know, LA Times, New York Times. So I think those types of things and people reading it, you know, are driving a new customer base into the dispensaries. So, um, you know, th those are the types of things that we've been able to um, really benefit from and know that, you know, PR is a real driver to, um, you know, just market acceptance and awareness and having us being uh, accepted as a real viable health and wellness brand for women. It's outstanding. Um, Jonathan? Yes, it's a complicated question. It's It's got many layers to it. But for us, uh, we're seeing some inroads in terms of display at retail. Um, it's it's a challenge, as everybody knows, depending on the dispensary. There may be, it may be on a shelf, it may be behind a counter, maybe under glass, maybe live product, maybe not product. <laughs> So, so we, we have to be able to accommodate all of those things, which, which can really be um, daunting. Uh, but, you know, we look at it as a two-pronged approach. We want to do all that we can to educate bud tenders and, and dispensaries about our, our product and what differentiates us. Um, but we also know we have the responsibility as a brand to, to drive people into stores and hopefully to have a, a conversation with, with customers who, you know, we call them fence sitters, but those that are are open to shopping but maybe haven't yet or are intimidated by by the prospect of going into dispensary for a variety of reasons. We want to start to have a conversation with them, start to help them become predisposed to a brand like Jetty and go in and, and start to help get some product out of store as well. Um, but it's uh, it's absolutely a, a, a work in progress and uh, you know uh, Michael you mentioned you know, stigma. I think we're all we're all concerned about stigma but I, I personally believe that one of the, the best most powerful things we can do is to have these polished consumer brands like you would expect in any other industry. So you look at what Kikoko's doing, or, or Two Roots, or Condescent, or Moxie, and folks here. Beautiful. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous work. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's, um, it's, that's really going to go a long way in helping to, to drive people into our world and, and reduce the stigma. So uh, b before we um, move on to Harris, because you've got such a unique um, perspective, Harris, that I, I'm really, I want to hear more about how you've looked at the previously regulated industries that um, that you've worked in and and now as you venture into this one um, but Jonathan really quick so uh, your relationship with um, bud tenders and buyers just circle that just a little bit and and what's your experience been so far yeah so you know as, as you imagine we have a, we have a sales force we have a brand ambassador team and and we work hard to treat all of them like we would want to be treated ourselves right so so we we work hard to do the things that we believe are the right things to do in terms of certainly educating bud tenders, sampling where we can, swag. So some of it is is really block and tackling and, and being there and being present and, and listening and just being a good partner all around. And, and we have you know great rep team that, that you know we believe is listening to the needs of, of the clubs and, and trying to, to provide a product mix and service and you know, we are self distributed, which certainly presents some opportunities and some challenges so so we, you know we, we work through that as well uh, but that's a job that like a lot of what we're doing is, is never done so we're, we're, we're constantly working on that trying to improve and um, trying to differentiate Jetty from all the others which is could be a, another long topic of conversation but um, that's something we're trying to establish in, in the minds of bud tenders and, and dispensary owners and buyers do unto others I think that's a good that's a good way to lead please well, I, just, I think it's also showing that you're a steadfast partner. So, uh, you know, in a, the dispensary, if they find that your product is selling and they're reordering, they want to make sure that you're there for the reorder. And, uh, you know, no, and, and, and there's so many complications with that, with the supply chain and those sorts of things. But you just, you know, before you get in too many stores, you want to make sure that you can really meet, 
you know, the scaling needs. And, you know, when your, your dispensary puts in an order, you want to be able to, you know, fulfill that order. So that's incredibly important. Yeah, so um, my perspective is that marketing, it, it's actually pretty simple. It boils down to physical availability and mental availability. Uh, physical, physical availability is just all about being distributed. Um, it's all about being present. Uh, if you're not present, then anything you do on kind of the mental availability side, which is all the advertising and, and, and everything you do to communicate your brand, um, it's actually wasted money if you don't have the, 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 the correct amount of physical distribution. And it's not just physical distribution, it's, it's how you show up at the shelf. And you guys mentioned this a little bit as well. If you can have education material, um, that, I mean, so much needs to happen with education. So to the extent that you can provide that at shelf, to the extent that your packaging itself can actually uh, utilize uh, those kinds of messages, I think it's very helpful. Uh, to, to the extent that you can actually educate the bud tenders and in other retail environments um, that, you know, keep people in the stores, that's going to go a long way to, you know, getting your brand recommended, but also, again, to educate uh, consumers. This is all about driving new penetration. It's not about getting someone, you know, the 10 to 12 percent of the population in adult use states that are already using to use a little bit more. It's about driving penetration to the levels of, like, alcohol, where I came from, which is over 90 percent. This is a penetration place. So there has to be that education. Um, to, to answer your question about uh, uh, my, ex my past ex experiences um, in highly regulated, regulated industries, there's a few things that you should really focus on. You should focus on if you have data um, to communicate, if you have something that is differentiating uh, from the other brands uh, based on data, really important. When I worked in, in consumer healthcare, uh, we said things like, works twice as fast, right? We said, if you have data, it's compelling, and you can say it because you have the data to support it. No one's going to stop you from saying that. Another thing that's important is leveraging key opinion leaders, le leveraging influencers. Uh, so whether it was my uh, consumer healthcare days where we leveraged doctors as, uh, as key opinion leaders or pharmacists or nurse practitioners, or whether it's in my um, beverage alcohol days where we leverage uh, you know, influencers like on Instagram and, and Facebook, the key is you have to have a right influencer strategy before just jumping in and, and hiring a, you know, a, a music artist or somebody else just because you think they're cool. Uh, it has to align with what we said before, your brand, and you have to have a strategy about how to engage with them and what they're actually bringing to you, and there's a whole process for that. I think aligning with media, um, if you're friendly with media, you're going to go places, especially when you can't communicate uh, as openly, right, um, uh, in, the, in, in the consumer marketplace. So get to know key people in media uh, and, and drive, and drive uh, those relationships. Uh, but there's others, but I'll, I'll be quiet now and pass the mic. Yeah. I can actually give, if you don't mind, a, a specific example to your point, Harris. Um, we had the article in Oprah Magazine launched last April, so you can imagine how many you know millions of people that that article went up to, out to, and uh, it was. And somebody asked today in the in the breakout session, they said, "Oh, did you get much uptick from the you know from the Oprah halo effect?" And you know we just didn't really have we didn't have enough market penetration at the time. Chelsea, how many dispensaries were in at that time? About. 40 so we were in 40 dispensaries so we really right. couldn't take advantage so of if you had the physical distribution if you yeah, had the physical if had, availability if we had, had physical distribution i think we really would have seen the apra the oprah uh halo effect and we didn't have our dtc model model up so you know people couldn't get it so it was a great article nonetheless and we you know obviously we talk about it all the time and it was tremendous validation not only for kikoko but the industry but that's a, a direct example of you know be ready be ready yeah are you suggesting using half of our packaging for a warning label isn't very educational? Is that <laughs> yeah, uh, that, yeah. Well, the, the, the I, advantage I, I, I of it, and it, I yeah. think this is really important too, you mentioned uh, a little bit about friends and media, right? And, and cultivating those types of relationships. And of course, uh, you know, as a brand, you're going to be faced with the point in time in your, in your arc where you're going to go, it would be great if this person endorsed our product, right? And, you know, you're talking about the, the halo effect and in advance of getting up here on the panel, I Googled you because I wanted to see who you were. And, and the first thing that pops up when I look at all the images and things like that is the Oprah thing. So to me, it is still a halo that you're um, in benefit of. And now that your business may have caught up to maybe some of the benefit of that, uh, I believe as consumers go out and consumers certainly do research on things that they look, they want to know, especially about something that could get them whooped out on the floor or it's going to put them into a state of bliss, they simply don't know, they do their research. And I think that um, you're still going to feel the benefit of that. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, at, a, at a previous conference that I had attended, uh, we were able to listen to the people that were launching um, brands with 
bands, right? And so there's uh, Cypress Hill and, uh, you know, Willie's brand and Bob Marley brand. And I was able to get involved in a conversation where we were talking about the ones that have made it, the ones that have succeeded, and ones that simply haven't, because not every musician has a right to go out and have a cannabis brand. Certain ones do and certain ones don't. And um, I'm sure in our lives there's going to be classes and theses that are going to be presented by professors that are going to examine the ones that made it, the ones that did it, and why they did it. So and, um, it's important though. Yeah, just to build on, on that point, uh, whether or not they have the right to, to, to be you know, um, a brand ambassador for that category is, is one thing. The other thing is do they fit with your brand, um, with, with, with the values of your brand, with the purpose of your brand, and are they bought in? Uh, I've seen a lot of failures, uh, not because it was the wrong artist, but it's because they weren't bought in. Uh, they, they just see themselves as getting paid whatever the amount of money is to do two posts a month, um, show up here or there, and it's a transactional um, relationship. Once you have a relationship that's transactional, we all know how those things work out. They don't work out. If, someone, if you bring someone into the brand because they embody it, if you uh, meet with them and have them come into your offices, if you take them out and show them the impact you're having on your consumers, uh, this is how you sell to the influencers so that they're not just a transactional relationship, but it's a partnership. And those are the ones that work. Yeah. Please. <laughs> yes. uh, I guess for me, it's, it's, uh, it's about being pr pragmatic, right? So you mentioned data. Data is important, but reach is important, um, both with Two Roots, uh, with, with Brewbuds, Just Society. Um, we're, you got to be able to connect with the consumer, but we also have to be able to connect with the bud tenders before we're ever in the store. If they don't know who you are, you're going to have an uphill battle. Right? Hey, I got beautiful packaging. Great. There's 27 different pre-rolls in our store. There's 24 flower providers. There's 17 edible suppliers. There's 13 vape suppliers, right? So why am I going to buy yours over theirs? If they don't know who you are before you show up there, you've lost. As a consumer, if we can't connect with a consumer before they end up in a store, then you've lost, right? The second thing. What's your in-store presence look like? Because we have to be in the store. Or do you have uh, interactive merchandising? We like to call it interactive merchandising. So today we put kegerators in the lobbies. We have our pop-up techs can go in and host it, but the employees can host it. We've installed built-in bars, tasting bars, where our coffees, teas, and beers can be uh, sampled while waiting. They get education, they engage employees, it becomes experiential. So first outside, second inside. Now if I do a good job connecting with the bud tenders, then the second they get to the counter, I've got a friendly selling environment, right? But before I can get even there, I need the data, to your point. Yeah. What is the sell through data? Statistically, what's going on? Two Root sells in certain stores in Vegas at about 6% of all transactions results in a beer. In my store, 10% of all transactions results in a beer. I spoke to uh, the owner of Harvest today. I said, hey, 5% of my revenues is beer. It outsold gummies. I had data, real data I could put in front of them, right? right? So the question is value. If you're bringing value, people are gonna buy from you. With no value, you're not gonna get bought from. So we're right now finalizing a mobile app that takes the statistical sales through data of any SKU from a store and can crunch it into consumer demand over a 30-day period which then provides the value to the buyer to understand that, hey, I need 50 cases of this product next month. Because our buying environment's immature. They're not doing data analytics, supply chain management, and trying to figure out what their next 90-day plan is. They're looking at inventory and saying, I'm gonna run low, I need some more of this. Hey, can I get some of that, right? So how do we deliver value beyond just our products? Because when things get tight and competition builds up, it's the value that gets you last look and keeps you in the store. Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, what, one of the, um, benefits of a brand is that you can grow brands. You can create new SKUs. You can listen to the market. You can utilize the data points that you've seen. Um, and so uh, I'm really curious about how, uh, let's just say, a fledgling brand starts, right? Because you all had a, you all, you came into things, but you know, everybody had a concept typically at the beginning of their brand that they, they recognized a need and they're going to try to fill that need, right? And so you start in one spot. And I think, uh, It'd be interesting to hear um, how you diversify the product SKUs that you have and uh, how you arrive at those. And given that we have about four minutes left to talk about, um, if uh, each of you also wanted to 
um, identify a brand that you admire, not your own, um, today, and, and kind of talk about why that is. Because as marketers, you have a, you have a unique qualifier to have that opinion. So, um, so the first one is how do you diversify your SKUs and how do you kind of think about that? And then the second one would be um, what brands do you admire? You can take that as well. Sure. Sure. I, I guess on the, the first part is is really understanding what the consumers are looking for and how do your brands fit it. So if we take a look at, uh, and something I mentioned earlier today that I was ignorant on, is that some of the largest beer manufacturers in the world are actually offering analogs to beer, something that's an inexpensive, flavor-rich, maybe low-calorie. So each time you do that flavor-rich, it's a market segment. If I say it's low-calorie, it's a market segment. And how do I leverage what I've already built to create uh, analogs of that, which allow me to introduce new products, new SKUs at a lower cost point and a faster, more speed to market, right? So that's our thinking. Is how, And also, because in our space, infrastructure can be limited, how do I leverage the infrastructure I've already built to manufacture more products? If I have to put in five different lines of packaging, I'm going to run out of space, I'm going to have challenges. So, so all those things come into what am I going to develop and where am I going to take it in the long term. Uh, when I look at brands that I admire, I, I, think I, I think Akiva. Right? I think they've done a great job, especially in California. Uh, they got a respected brand. I've never met anyone that's had anything negative to say about consuming Kiva. So you look at that and you go, they've done a great job because what, what it resonates there is really quality. Right? They can trust it. And I, I say this and some people laugh at me, but McDonald's isn't the greatest hamburger in the world. But it's the same hamburger everywhere in the world. right? So you know what you're going to get. And that becomes very important. So I think Kiva's done a great job with, they have great packaging, good distribution, but their quality, I think, is what has them stand out. Yeah, I, I think the question about brand um, architecture is a very good one. Um, and I think there's a lot of challenges. There's so much opportunity. And I'm, one of the reasons I love cannabis is because the industries I came from, with bev alcohol, you're dealing with a liquid, right? There are other liquids, like you're mentioning, beer and wine and RTDs, but it's all liquid. Uh, consumer healthcare, we're, we're basically all pills, right? Uh, I mean, there's some other form factors, but mostly people take pills. Here, you've got so much opportunity with all these form factors. Agreed. This is and, why I asked the question. And this is, and this is, therein lies the challenge, because you as a brand need to understand who you're serving, to your point, for what occasion are you serving this for, what are the needs, both functional and emotional, and how do you deliver against those? If you start proliferating uh, SKUs just because you can, you're not going to be standing for what you need to stand for. You're not going to be delivering uh, what you need to, to deliver. So I worry, quite frankly, uh, about brands that are doing this. Who knows the brand Corona? How many, how many different um, SKUs or different you know, variants does Corona have? Like, like one or two. Right? Corona Light. Uh, Corona Light and, and, Fresca. and, and, and Corona, right? Um, when you close your eyes, close your eyes Don't for a second. Don't forget Fresca now. Fresca. Come on. Uh, okay, basically. Refreshka. Close your eyes for a second. And if I said, think of, you know, when you think of Corona, what comes to mind? Where are you? How many of you would say beach? Raise your hand. Beach. Okay. They're able to do that, not because they launched a bunch of different forms, a bunch of different variants. Uh, they did that because they have one or two over a long period of time communicating that, that you can be transformed to that moment of relaxation at the beach. You don't have to actually be at the beach. It's just transformation in your mind. But they're able to do that because you're not proliferating and you're not creating all these different sub-brands and variants and form factors. So my, my word of caution is do right by your brand and by the consumer and don't just take opportunity because it's there. Yeah, yeah for us, we, at Jetty, we, we certainly look at data, market data, um, predictions about trends, but again, it comes back to making product we believe in and product we want to make, um, but doing it in our way. So for example, we have uh, a line that we call botanic and it's a flavored line, but for us, you know, not a knock against people who would want to do it this way, but, but it's not authentic for us to come out with bubble gum or cotton candy or something. For us, it's all about all natural. Um, so we have flavors like chai and vanilla chamomile, and um, it is an all natural high potency product that kind of fits our ethos. And so, so there's a little bit of that where we just want to create things that we want to create. And as we get into other things like, you know, shatter and concentrates and things, um, it's just coming from a place of, of kind of purity. And so we then on the marketing side go and, and market that. And it's actually it's funny that I ended up in a very similar ethos kind of a place, but in previous to cannabis, I was in the guitar business. And so at uh, the brand I worked for, Taylor Guitars, it, it was the same thing where the, 
the guy in charge, Bob, would create a guitar that he wanted to make, and then we'd go figure out how to sell it. And that lasted for, for a long time, and eventually you get more sophisticated, and there's more data available, and so there's maybe a hybrid of, of those things, instinct and data. But there's sort of a beauty and an a authenticity in that that makes it, I don't know, it just makes for a really great, great story. And, um, I don't know, did you mean So uh, maybe you just want to talk about, uh, in, given the, uh, the time constraints, what is a brand that you admire? Did you mean within the space or anywhere? Just anywhere. Uh, you know, recently, of course, that's a moving target. I, I've kind of been obsessed with Yeti lately, the cooler. Oh, sure, sure. That's a cool brand. Yeah, yep. you know, I, a lot I, of beer I, in those. It just happens to rhyme with Yeti. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it does. Um, it does, but I, I'm obsessed with brands that can take something that, to me, it's, it's just an, a forgotten yeah. kind of product. The cooler's a cooler. I never thought of it. I, Dyson was another one. Like, I never thought of vacuum for the first... 40 years of my life, and now all of a sudden I want a vacuum, right? Like, uh, how amazing is that, right? Um, but but vacuums, Yeti's done a great job. Vacuums can be very zen. That? Very zen vacuums. Thank yeah. you. They are, they are. I love them. I have like three. Um, um, but Yeti's created this this great brand, and a lot of it comes through content marketing, which is something I'm, I'm passionate about, and, and something we, we just launched at Yeti. Uh, uh, called Jetty Stories, but it's letting people in to see our world, and Yeti did something similar where you understand where this cooler came from, why they built it the way they built it. So if you go on our website right now, you can see, you can meet Nate, you can understand what goes into our products, you can, you can, you can learn about how we feel about talking to new consumers and, and, and the raids we've been through having been in this industry for a long time. So, um, so that's, all, that's all part of it. That's, that's a great example. Jennifer? I'm going to start with my example, and since I can go outside the cannabis industry, I was going to actually say Lighthouse because I'm a beer drinker, and I was really impressed with your beer, so good job on that. Thank you. And uh, outside the industry, I would actually say the Dollar Shave guy. Oh, my God, that guy. Talk about heart and soul. I love that guy. <laughs> he, and he was in a if – you, if you haven't seen his commercials, you need to go check out their commercials, and they just came out with one over the Super Bowl, and he had a cameo in it, so I thought that was great. But that, talk about heart and soul. Um it's interesting because we're doing the exact opposite of what Harris uh, recommends doing uh, in terms of product proliferation. We've got a whole innovation pipeline. Uh, we had a very interesting conversation about this last night with Harris. But you're you're you're, fig you're phasing. You're figuring out the cadence of uh, yeah. of how you launch them, when you launch them. It's okay to have a plan for the architecture, but at the right at the right time. Yeah, and and, uh, and we were up till twelve thirty last night debating this. So it was it was it was fascinating. Uh, no cannabis involved whatsoever, though. No, not at all. And. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, we say that our customers are, you know, we're female-centric, um, we're unabashed about that, and our customers we know are 21 to 101, and we know that they're, you know, that they all enjoy different form factors. We know the millennials, and we have a lot of millennials that, that work at Kikoko. We know that they love to smoke. So we're like, okay, what if we could kikoko a joint? We're going to call them petites, so we're going to have three effects-based, um, three effects-based products. And the millennials—they're just so excited for that. But you know, it comes up because we've done a ton of research. We I mean we've interviewed thousands of people. We've got a lot of people, you know, emailing us. We get testimonials. We say, "Hey, have you thought about this?" And then when we were doing a lot of work recently with seniors, we do a lot of work with seniors. We love we we love the senior market. And they said, "Give us a tincture. We'd love a tincture for sleep, and we'd love a a, a, a tincture for calm." So we said, "Okay, that's a that's a huge emerging growing market." But it, for us, if you saw our deck or if you see our deck at some point, I mean, we're doing it very cohesively. Um, our hemp-derived products are going to be very much the look and feel of Kikoko. And we just have the most outstanding, if I can brag about them, um, design and branding team. It's all done internally. And literally, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're just pouring their hearts into this. And you can just see it's just a, a feeling that you get. I mean, they're just infusing this brand. And we are, I feel like, with just, you know, I call it, not only are we infusing it with THC, but we're infusing our products with TLC, <laughs> and uh, and you really do feel that. I mean, I, I I personally feel like that comes out in our in our products. So I think it's it's unlimited what we can do. But to Harris's point, I think there's there's definitely a cadence to that. And obviously, we want to be opportunistic. And there's you know we want to uh, you know uh, uh, do well financially and create products for people that they'll enjoy in all different uh, form factors. I think it's interesting though is that we need you got to take a little bit of the backstory. And Harris is coming from a very mature, very competitive uh, market segment. We're in a very immature segment. And, and I always look around and say, well, what's someone else doing and, and why are they doing it? And so when you think about, um, I'll use Constellation Brands, right? What have they developed? Is it done? 
is the packaging done? Have they bought the inventory? Are the labels done? Is it all in a warehouse somewhere waiting for the date to come to turn the machines on? Willy Wonka's factory, right? I guarantee you it is. And as entrepreneurs in this space, if we don't use this time just as you are now to look at your product categories, look at innovation, look at what you're going to do next, because you, we can't waste this time. Right? You have to spread yourself wide. You have to be. You have to spread out because this product could take off. This one could fail, and you can't work linearly. And we have to use the time today. And on that note, everybody in here needs to work on their brands. I hope you've enjoyed our panel. Thank you. <laughs>